Right guys, let's make a start. Let's crack on. <laughs> Are you in a rush? Right. Let's start. I'm going to start. If you've got a Bible, uh, open it up to page 972, Matthew chapter 8. That's what we're going to be looking at in a minute. Chapter 8 it is, that's what we're starting with. <laughs> Better not. Oh, it's just 972 in English. Right, that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to pray. I'm just going to pray for a uh, situation here. It's been a bit of a... I've been away on holiday, but I've been hearing about stuff that's going on. It's been a bit of a tough week in the scheme. There's been uh, some some deaths. We want to pray for families of people involved in that. We want to pray for the area as a whole. I uh, want to pray as well for further afield, not just what's happening in the scheme here. We're going to pray for uh, two countries today, actually. Uh, two countries that you've probably never heard of. Uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, these are two countries that are currently involved in uh, a huge conflict at the moment. Hundreds of thousands of people have been homeless. Uh, hundreds of people have been killed in this war that's going on between these two countries. Uh, so we're going to pray for them uh, and then we'll look at God's word. So let's uh, begin by praying together. Let's pray. Father, we just uh, thank you that you're a God of all the nations that you care for, all the world. Thank you that Jesus is the saviour of the entire world. Father, we do pray for these two nations of Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, we pray, Lord, for an end to the conflict there. Father, I know they had a ceasefire and it only lasted about two minutes, but we pray for a permanent ceasefire. Pray for the victims of uh, the, that terrible war that's going on there at the moment. People who have lost uh, households, livelihoods, people who have lost friends and families in that conflict. Father, we just ask for peace between these two nations. Father, we pray for the church in these countries. Pray for the church in Armenia. Thank you, Lord, that um, there's a growing number of Christians in that nation. We pray that many more would come to know you uh, through the ministry of that church. We pray, Lord, that um, the Bible would go out and that people would be saved. We pray the same for Azerbaijan. It's a country of 9 million people and only 0.2% of the population there are evangelical Christians. So we ask, Lord, that you would grow your church in that nation and they would come to know the life-saving gospel of the Lord Jesus. Father, we want to pray for uh, our scheme here. We want to pray for Charleston. We want to pray for people here, people who have been struggling with lockdown, people who have struggled with mental health, people who have struggled with addiction. And, and all of it's just been heightened, Lord. We just pray again for the peace that surpasses understanding. Father, we pray um, off the back of suicide and overdose. We pray for families of those that have been affected by that. And we ask, Lord, that you would bring restoration. And we thank you, Jesus, that what we have is hope. Real, true, lasting hope. So please, Lord, would people come to know that hope um, and would you set them free from sin and from darkness. Please, would the light of your gospel shine out, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to be starting a new series here, looking through three chapters of Matthew's gospel. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, 9 and 10. Um, that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, let me tell you why we're doing this. Um, what I've got, right, for anyone who's interested, some of you might be interested, some of you might not. If you want to know Matthew's Gospel, what it's about and how it's structured, I've actually got a wee sheet that explains it. So if you want to understand Matthew's Gospel, rather than me talking you through it, you can just grab a sheet on the way out and it'll explain the different sections. Roughly speaking, the Gospel is actually split into five sections. Um, and we're not going to start in chapter one. We're actually going to start in chapter 8. Uh, the reason for that is because it ties into a lot of the stuff that we looked at in Jonah. I think it's really appropriate to, um, to what's going on 
in our lives, in our community, uh, and I hope that we will find it helpful. Uh, so this is what it's about. This is what I've called this series in Matthew 8, 9, and 10. It's about when God's king confronted the world. So in Matthew's gospel, one of the things that he really wants to convince you of when you read it, he wants to convince you that Jesus is God's long-promised king. Jesus is God's long-promised king. And in these chapters, what Jesus does is he confronts everything that is wrong with us and everything that is wrong with this world. This is what the Bible says about the world that we live in, okay? This is what the Bible says. The Bible says this, our world is under the judgment of God. That's what the scripture says. And the reason that there's brokenness, the reason that there's disease, the reason that there's death, that there's suffering, that there's evil in this world is because we are under God's judgment. Collectively, this whole world is under the judgment of God. And it's a consequence of the fact that all of us as human beings are sinners. We have chosen to turn away from the God who made us and we have chosen instead to serve ourselves. We're rebels. And so when Matthew in his gospel talks about God's king coming down to this world, you'd almost think that God's king is coming to to destroy the world, to wipe it out if it's really that messed up. But the good news of this gospel is that God's king did not come to destroy this world. He's come to save this world. He's come to redeem this world. He's come to restore this world. And that is what we're going to see Jesus doing in these chapters. It's two things about Jesus, right, when we look at this that are going to stand out. One is his amazing authority. Like Jesus just has an authority like nothing else. And the second thing that's really going to stand out when you look at Jesus in these chapters is his compassion. Jesus cares more than anyone else. His authority and his compassion. And the response of the crowds to everything Jesus does is one of astonishment. So my, my hope is that as we look at this together, um, we'll just be astonished. We'll be amazed at who Jesus is and at how much Jesus cares. And I hope it will motivate us to go and tell people about him. Because uh, he is the most important person in the universe. His gospel is the most important news in the entire universe. Uh, let's read it then. Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to read verse 1 to 17. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. And Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go Show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I, am a man, I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from east and from west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and he bore our diseases. Okay, uh, let's look at this together. Let me just pray again. And then we'll look at the Bible together. Father, just ask you would speak to us now through your word. 
Help us to see Jesus. Help us to understand him uh, and speak to our hearts, we pray, this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Right, three stories there. Can you see what links the three stories together? Can I put a clue up on the screen? <coughs> what links these three stories? Compassion, yes. Yeah. The, healing, the healing of Jesus. Yeah, right, there's, there's three miracles all about Jesus healing people. Um, healing people who are uh, extremely ill. Like, it's not just someone who's got a little cough. Uh, you, what we've got the first story, you've got a leper. Um, leprosy, by the way, was a fatal... St- I, I don't think leprosy exists anymore, does it? It still does, yeah, do you get that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, In India, Pakistan, there's still parts of it. Well, it's a, it's a fatal skin disease, and I think what it does is it damages your nerve endings, and people who have got leprosy can't feel anything, and bits of their body start to fall off. I mean, it's a, it's a horrible, horrible disease. Um, so you've got a guy, that Je- that's the first guy Jesus meets. Then you've got Centurion who comes to talk to Jesus about his servant who is paralyzed. Right, that's pretty extreme. And then the final healing we've got here is Peter's mother-in-law who has a fever, which back then, we're going back 2,000 years here, back then when you had a fever, it wasn't just like, you know, oh, your temperature's high, just put some frozen peas on your head. Uh, if you had a fever back then, it, it meant you are dying. Um, It was a fatal disease. So that's what we've got. Three forms of like an extreme sickness that Jesus is confronting. And so what we're going to see today, what we're going to look at today is Jesus' authority over sickness and disease. Right? This is a huge problem. I I don't need to, well, I don't need to convince anyone that that's a problem. A guy in China eats a bat, gets a disease, and that small microscopic virus causes global devastation more more devastation than anything else that that tiny little there it is there the coronavirus thing that little ball with the bits sticking out of us i think so well whether or not that's where it came from if you believe the conspiracy theorists or not nevertheless the virus is real and it's devastated the world this virus um sickness and disease is everywhere uh as old age kicks in, body starts to fail. What are you looking at me for? Is that right? <laughs> Arthritis. People have to manage diseases like epilepsy or uh, diabetes. There's more extreme illnesses, right? I know of a couple who have a child that was born with leukemia. Most of us will know someone or we will ourselves at some point have to confront the big disease of our time which is cancer that small silent fatal killer destroys people devastates families we've got a friend of ours just now who's caught in the throes of that illness and it's horrible when you see disease what it does to a person how it slowly erodes them and eats away at them yep it's everywhere it's not just physical illness is it it's mental illness People who have depression, anxiety, dementia, sickness and disease is everywhere. And what it shows to us is that there's something wrong with this world. There's something broken. This is, like I said at the start, this is a world that's under judgment. Now, don't mishear that. People's illnesses, is what I'm not saying, I'm not saying people's illnesses are a direct punishment from God. So it's not like, oh hey, I, I've said a lie, therefore God's punished me. That's not, yeah. that's not how it works in the Bible. That's not what we see. Um, I know plenty of, of faithful Christians who followed Jesus faithfully all their life and they've had severe sicknesses. And it's nothing to do with anything that they've done that's wrong. But what I'm saying is that the reason in general why there is sickness in this world is because humanity in general as a whole has turned away from its creator. This world is is in decay. But here in Matthew chapter 8, we see the great healer, one who can come and bring restoration. All the doubt in the world. Yeah. Doubted, they can handle it, but by one day, when that owner affects them, 
I mean, if, if we think about any disease, what, what the Bible would say is be very careful of saying God has allowed that disease to happen because somebody has done something wrong. So it says we shouldn't do that because we don't know what God does. Some people believe that, but the truth is we don't know. But in general, what we do know is that this world is dark, that this world is broken. And They're doubting, they're pushing God away, kind of thing. They're yeah. pushing the truth away. Yeah, I so that could cause like stuff to happen in their body. Yeah, I so I think according yeah. I think what the scripture would say is doubt doesn't lead to sickness. Uh, um no, but so like if you're being spirit even spiritually blind, like like it's gonna cause like you could get a temperature by like being people might call it stressed out, but it's just ignoring like the truth. Yeah, but yeah, but like I said, it might just be that you just met the wrong person, and it's nothing to do with you. I, I think so. What what I want to be careful of saying is that somebody's sick because of something specific that's happened. That can happen, and God can do that. But actually, um, we. Uh, well, it's like we do it. It's like that's self destruction at times because, like, obviously, like it, it takes a lot of people to get to that yeah so yeah well let's look at this look at what happens here in this chapter um so in general there's sickness because this world's under judgment but what we see is that actually when god's king come when jesus comes he has this immense power to to undo this thing that troubles us this this sickness um and so what i want to do as we look at this is is kind of look at what do these healing miracles teach us about jesus first of all and then we'll kind of close by looking at how we should respond because the leper the centurion and peter's mother-in-law um, are great examples to us that we can learn from so i want to, want to respond like them but let's ask the question like what does this actually teach us about um jesus like why does jesus do these healing miracles sharing his compassion yeah well that i think well we'll see three things we'll see three things here in this passage um, they all begin with P, so it should be easy to remember. Here's the first reason, right, Jesus healed people, to prove that he has the authority, right? Why did Jesus do this? Because he wanted to, because he wanted to prove to the world that he is God's king and he has authority over sickness. Now, if we look at this passage, there's loads in here about the authority of Jesus. I mean, you've got this leper to begin with, so he had this horrible skin disease. It would be like... Um, you ever seen that film night of the living dead <laughs> yeah zombie film um that's probably what he would have looked like he wouldn't have needed any makeup and that's what he was he I mean he was like walking death you could not go near him because if you caught this disease then you would die i mean we're, we're, yeah wearing a wearing a mask isn't going to help when you come up against a leper in fact what lepers um had to do in the ancient world, what lepers had to do was they had to walk around with a bell um, and they would ring that bell to let people know they were coming so that everyone could scarper and get away from them. Um, and they had to yell out, unclean, unclean, um, so people would know that they were coming. See, this is the thing that about disease, about sickness, it's what it does is it Somebody isolates. Some of the pure stones get stoned as well. It was, yeah, it was a horrible, isolating debilitating condition disease isolates we've seen that this year disease has isolated people but what this leper does is he comes and he kneels before king jesus and he says to him lord if you are willing you can make me clean and look at verse three look at what jesus does i think this is incredible this is what we're talking about the power and the compassion of jesus he reaches out and he touches his hand now I don't know how long he had this disease, but I reckon this would probably be the first time that he ever felt another touch from another person in a long time. Jesus touches the man that no one else would go near and he says to him, I am willing, be clean. And look at what Matthew describes uh, uh, happening to him. He says immediately, immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy, just like that. 
right? See, there's this power with Jesus. You see in the, the next story as well with the centurion servant, this, this centurion, um, which is like this, this army general, he comes to Jesus wanting help because one of his servants is paralyzed. Uh, and actually in verse six, he says that he's at home and he's suffering terribly, right? Again, this is, this is back in the day before morphine or painkillers or anything like that. But look at the centurion. I mean, the centurion is incredible here. Um, you know, people are astonished at Jesus, but this is the one time in the gospel that Jesus actually gets astonished at another person. Um, this person is incredible. He, he says to Jesus, he, he knows that he is a, that the, the person in front of him is not just a guy, that Jesus is someone with great authority. And so verse eight, he says to Jesus, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes. That one come and he comes. I say to my servant do this and he does it. So here's what he's saying. He's saying look I'm top dog general right. I know what it is to be a person in authority. And I know that as the top dog general if I say something then all the people underneath me would have to do it. I know that that's what I can do. But Jesus, when I look at you, I know that you are greater in authority than anyone else in all creation. And I know that all you have to do is say something and everything in creation will have to answer to you. And Jesus is like, wow, I can't believe that, that you have this faith. Look how it ends in verse 13. Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed. Here's the key word. At that moment. At that moment, the servant was healed. Touches the leper, instantly he's healed. He speaks, instantly that um, servant is healed. And it's the same thing with uh, Peter's mother-in-law as well. Just a sentence there. Look at verse 15. He touched her hand, her fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. Just like that, right? She's got a fever, touches the hand, boom, fever gone. What does she do? She gets up and she offers Jesus a brew. Yeah. That, that is the power of this king, right? Instantly disease is gone. Instantly the, the disease, the illness that, that troubles us, that plagues us, that, that has ruined society at the moment is gone when he just speaks a word. I mean, Matthew sums it up in verse 16 when he says that um, many who were demon possessed were brought to him. He drove out spirits with a word and he healed all who were ill. This is, yeah, this is proof. This is the big point though. This is proof that Jesus is the king and that he has all the authority. Look, if we um, right, think about your illnesses, if with all the advances of medicine, we still cannot stop disease. We still cannot and will not ever be able to prevent death. We're floored by that microscopic virus, COVID. No one but Jesus has the authority to end sickness. No one. It's always going to be with us. And, and if you live long enough and no accidents happen to you, eventually sickness will take you and you'll die. We're so helpless. And you know, I... I don't, people always talk about fighting back when you get an illness and, and I understand, understand why they say that, you know, talk about trying to, to battle cancer and I know what they mean, it's like keeping going and working through it, but there's something about that that's really disheartening, you can't, you can't fight a disease like that, no matter how determined you are, it doesn't stop it. It's optimism, really, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah, well, that's it, yeah. It's, optimism, it's trying to be optimistic, but it's hard to be optimistic when this disease can just mm -hmm. kill people and deteriorate them so quickly. But here we see one, here we have the king, right? Who has the power to end it. And it's not just that he's able. Here's the amazing thing about Jesus. He's willing, right? If you're willing, the leper says, he says, I am willing heals it, it's gone. He holds the hands of the outcasts. 
And so here's the question then, right? If we're just getting this right, if we're hopefully seeing what Jesus is doing, here's the question that should be coming up in your mind. If Jesus can do that, right? If he does have this power, and if he really is that compassionate on the sick, why doesn't he do that today? We have the authority like, to do it. We have, we can't end disease though, unfortunately. In my opinion, if you, if you understand, like, uh, the worst person on this earth, if you understand them, then you can help them. You can help people, but you can't end it. You don't have the authority to end it. What, save it, get, ask me at the end, because we'll work through this. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think hopefully it'll make more sense. Um, no. Yeah, yeah. No, it's helpful. And ask me at the end as well, because I think it'll be quite helpful to come back to that. Because the question is then, if Jesus can do that, if he can just stop disease, why doesn't he just do that today? Um, like I said, I know many who follow Jesus and they're severely ill. Why doesn't he just heal them? Here's why. And this is so important. And this links to the second thing that we're going to see from these miracles. The main reason Jesus came to earth was not to heal from sickness, right? Do you not think it's interesting in verse 4 that when he does heal the leper, he says, oh, by the way, don't tell anyone. That's a strange thing to do, isn't it? Why does he do that? Why? Because that's not his main purpose, right? At the end of the gospel, he's going to get his 12 disciples and he's going to say to them, go out and tell the world. But don't tell the world about healing from disease and sickness. Well, tell them that. Tell them that the main reason I have come, the main reason Jesus came was not to heal from sickness. The main reason Jesus came was to forgive sins. That's his big job, right? That's his main purpose. At the very beginning of the gospel, the, the angel says to Joseph before he's born, Mary's going to give birth to a son and you're going to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That is Jesus' number one priority uh, in the Gospels, to save people from their sins. And that makes sense, like we've said, because the reason there's sickness in the world is because there's sin. It's our sin that is the big problem. It's like, um, uh, Tom, you're a gardener, right? If you've got weeds in the garden, if you chop the head off the weed, it's not going to get rid of it right? It's just going to come back. You need to get to the roots, the root cause. The root cause of all that is wrong in this world is sin. And it's the sin that's inside all of us. And it's the sin that needs to be dealt with. That's the more serious issue. And so when Jesus heals people, he's saying, yes, look, this is proof that I have power over sickness and death. But here's the second thing. It's also a picture of what Jesus does to our sin as sinners. I mean, just think of that um, leper, right? Think of the leper. Just picture him in your mind isolated he's by himself sick dying unclean as he says that is how God views us in our sin now we are all sinners all sinners I say it all the time and we must get it we, we're, we're not innocent people and it's not just like the, the bad that we say and think and do every day I do every day the more serious issue is that the fact that it's, it's how we've treated the God who made us, which, to be honest, most of the time we, we don't treat him with any regard at all. And God sees everything that we hide from others. It, the Bible talks about our hearts being unclean. It's like, it's like there's dirt on us. It's why we're dying. And it's why we can't cleanse ourselves, right? You cannot, you cannot make yourself right with God by trying to be a good person. It's not enough because the, the disease of sin is there. It would be like the leper trying to heal himself by putting some new clothes on. We can't clean ourselves, but this is the good news. Jesus can and he will and he is willing. That's what, that's ultimately in Matthew's gospel, uh, well, in all the Gospels, but Matthew's building towards this. That's ultimately what he does on the cross. He takes the punishment that our sin deserves so that we can be clean, clean from any wrongdoing. And I think Matthew wants us to see that the healing ministry of Jesus is a picture of what he will do for all of us on the cross. And the reason I think that is because right at the end, verse 17, just have a look at that. 
This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Um, now, that's a quote taken from the book of Isaiah, Old Testament, written 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah chapter 53. Um, let me just, this is it in its context. You can see what this is about. It's not really about healing. What's Isaiah 53 about? Look what it says. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. This is Isaiah looking forward to Jesus, prophesying about the arrival of Jesus. Um, he took up our pain and bore our suffering. That's the bit that Matthew quotes, kind of retranslates it a wee bit. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. That means sin. Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace went on him. By his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to in our own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity, the sin of us all. You see, the description of God's king in Isaiah 53 is not about healing. It's about taking the punishment for our sins. But Matthew links Jesus' healing ministry with his work on the cross because he wants us to see that in taking the punishment for our sins, Jesus deals with the root cause of all sickness. Jesus' healing miracles are like a picture of the great healing miracle that he offers to everyone, the healing of sin. He heals that by taking that wretched disease on himself and by being crushed, by being punished in our place so that we could have peace, eternal peace. And that's the third thing, just to say really briefly about these miracles. Um, the third thing they do, they show us, is that they're a preview. They're a preview of what's to come in Jesus' kingdom. Could Jesus heal you of illness now? Yes, he could. Of course he could. He can do whatever he wants. He's got all the authority. Does Jesus promise he will heal you of your illnesses now? No. What he does promise you now, right now, this is guaranteed. He promises that if you come to him, he will cleanse you of all sin. We have that now in Christ. So sinner though I am, Jesus, God doesn't view me as a sinner because Jesus has cleansed it. It's all gone. Like I said, that I don't say this lightly, to be forgiven of sin is infinitely greater than a cure for cancer because it has eternal value. To be made right with God and his healing miracles are like a preview of what it is like to be with him in heaven. So um, in the kingdom of heaven, there's going, to be, there's going to be no face masks or social distancing, thankfully. Eh? There's going to be no tired people. There's going to be no paralysis. There's going to be no anxiety. There's going to be no worries. There's going to be no depression. There's going to be no wheelchairs, no crutches. There's going to be no injections or drugs or antibiotics. There's going to be no coughs, no stomach bugs, no bleeding. There's going to be no cancer, no leukemia, no transplants, no starvation. And ultimately, there will be no more death. In heaven, right, if you're a doctor and you go to heaven, you're out of a job. <laughs> Uh, so will I be. Preachers are out of a job in heaven because we're just going to learn from Jesus. So uh, I'll have to find something new to do. But that's what happens when you come to King Jesus. I might not be healed now, but I know that I will be healed then. Because my life is in the hands of the great physician, the King of Kings. And I know that he cares. And he has shown great compassion to me, to all who trust in him. Not by taking our hands, but by taking our sin upon himself and suffering for it in our place. But it's only if you respond to him rightly. And I just want to close by saying, how do we respond to this king with this authority over sickness and disease? And like I said, I think we see it, we see it in, in these three people, the leper, the centurion, and Peter's uh, mother-in-law. Um, by the way, notice that they trust Jesus. Well, I don't know about the mother-in-law, but certainly the leper and the centurion 
trust Jesus before Jesus heals them, not after, right? And look at what kind of unites them together. Look at, there's something about the way that these three approach Jesus that's really similar. So the leper, what does he do? Verse two, he kneels before Jesus. Centurion, verse eight, what does he say? He says, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. Peter's mother-in-law, what does she do? Immediately after she's healed, verse 15 tells us that she gets up and she waits on Jesus. She, she serves Jesus. You see, these are three people who worship Jesus. They bow before the king. They know they are not worthy to be in the presence of the king. And they serve the king. In each case, they recognize that Jesus is big and they are small. That's what they recognize. And so we need to respond like them. That's the right response. It's not it's thinking that Jesus is small and that, that, that Jesus is someone who's answerable to us, but it's recognizing that Jesus is the king. It's saying what the centurion says and says and saying, look, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. I don't care how powerful or great I think I am. I am not worthy of you. You are greater than me. That is someone who gets Jesus. And when you realize that you deserve nothing from Jesus, that's when you're really starting to understand who he is. We come to him like the leper comes with his disease. We, we come with our sin saying, Jesus, I don't deserve it, but please, please forgive me. Please make me clean. And we trust him. And that is the kind of people that will be restored by Jesus. And so if you are here, if you are a Christian, and you get hit with sickness, as you inevitably will, and people you know get hit with sickness, what do you do? Pray for healing? Yes. But always remember the greater healing that he has done. Trust him. He does not and he has not turned away from you. By the way, do you know what else unites these three people together? All three of them, all three of them are outcasts. Right? The leper was an outcast for obvious reason because of his skin disease centurion the army guy he's what um remember jesus this is a jewish culture he's what the jews would have called a gentile in other words he's an outsider that's why jesus is amazed that he gets it more than most of the jews do at his time he's an outsider he's a gentile outsider and peter's mother-in-law well she's a woman now that obviously doesn't mean anything today but back then the way that women were treated was almost like second-class citizens. Except that's not how Jesus treats her. That's not how Jesus treats any of them. I think Jesus cares about people in this scheme. You know, do you think Jesus cares about people we might consider as outsiders? The addicts, the lonely people, the elderly. Do you think the king of creation has time for us? Well, of course he does. See, Jesus loves to bring the outsider in. That's what he does. Come to him and he will not turn you away. I mean, look at what he says. This is what he says to the centurion in verse 10. Um, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from east and west and will take their place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, I'm, I'm getting people from all over the world, north, south, east, and west. And they're going to be with me in heaven. And I love how Jesus describes heaven in the Bible. His favorite way to describe heaven is not like a cloud with a dress, which doesn't sound like heaven at all. It's to talk about a feast. It's a party. It's a celebration. Death is gone. Sickness is destroyed. It's just this great eternal joy. feast of joy. Yeah. And that is the destination for all, anyone who trusts Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done in life. Cleansed of sin, brought to this heavenly banquet. But there is a bit of a warning at the end of it, isn't there? He goes on to say, But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness, where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is speaking of, of some of the the Jewish people at that time, not all of them, remember Jesus and his disciples were Jews, but some of them thought that they were in God's kingdom because they were Jews. 
They thought that because they had followed God and gone to church that it should mean that they're in. But the truth of the matter is that they didn't serve Jesus, worship Jesus, bow to Jesus. They just lived for themselves. And so as such, Jesus says, look, they will be cast out. Those who thought they were on the inside will be cast out. Those who everyone thought was on the inside is brought in. Cast out to a place of eternal darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we're not playing games here when we're talking about how we respond to Jesus. This is about eternity. But the king has come to save us from that. And that's why we're here in this scheme to tell people about this great healer, this great rescuer. Trust in him. Bring your brokenness to him. And one day you will be in that eternal feast because this king cleanses the unclean. He restores the broken. He touches the untouchable. And not only does he have the power, but he is so willing and so compassionate to us who don't deserve it. Let me pray and we'll take some questions. Father, thank you that we have uh, healing in Jesus the ultimate healing, the forgiveness of sins. And thank you that because we are forgiven now, we know that when we are with you, Jesus, at that great banquet, that great party, that great feast, we will celebrate because sickness and disease will be no more and it will be gone forever. Help us trust you. Always look to you. Help us to remember you're in charge. You're the boss. And help us also to remember that you are compassionate and kind. And even if we can't understand what you're doing, we know that you are good. So help us, we pray, in your name. Amen. Amen. Questions? Any questions? Can I ask you a question, but it's not yeah. about this, but it's about okay. chapter 8, 9, 10. Okay, yeah. Uh, it says, the man says, to the Lord, can I bury my father first? Yeah. And the Lord says, I don't know what the dead bury their own dead. Yeah. What is that? Is that a metaphor? That's a... Uh, that is a cliffhanger for next week. So if you come back next week, I'll have the answer. Because I don't know. Because we'll look at it. We'll look at it next week. So hopefully, try and explain it. Um, but it's just as a brief answer to tie in with this. It's all about the someone who's a genuine follower of Jesus has Jesus as their priority, even above really important family tasks, like. Jesus has to be above that. He has to be number one. Yeah. 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 Uh, any more questions? Sorry. That's good. It's more, it's more about uh, in this present generation, just seeing the, the, the leprosy. Wait a sec. The, the man with leprosy and yeah. Jesus' willingness. I'm just thinking more about this present generation, us in particular, in Charleston, people we addiction, people in isolation, people with mental health, people feeling lonely, people yeah. just doesn't feel that they've got anybody to turn to. Yeah. The willingness of our Lord. Yeah. Just that assurance of saying, I'm here for you. Yeah. So people have to place their heart and soul into Jesus to say, Well he is willing. He should yeah. be here. The evidence is clear. It's, it's about saying to ourselves, everybody it's non believing. And the fact is this is true. This is the truth. This is facts, what Jesus yeah, is saying. He, sh he wants to show you his willingness to help you. And I think a lot of people in Charleston, in this game, are lost. They're struggling. And I just feel that as a yeah. great assurance. That is, that's it. It's exactly the point, isn't it? There's great willingness from yeah. Jesus. He's, all, he's calling people to him. There's yeah. no reluctance yeah. at all. Yeah. So, yeah, well that, uh, that's, a, that's a helpful answer. I mean, ultimately, it, it's really hard, but it's not about what other people think of you. It's about what God thinks of you. Um, and, and I understand, yeah, but maybe he might want you to, like, because God cares about each and other too, so, like, obviously, he would want you to seek his guidance as well from someone. Yeah, someone in the world. Yeah, definitely. Good. I no bother. Right, guys. If anyone's got any more, qu have you got a question, Anne? Sorry. 
If anyone's got any questions or queries, feel free to speak to me afterwards. Uh, if you want a cup of tea or coffee, you may see it. If you want to go out for a fag, then join the, the, the crew that's already gone out. Um, and see you later. Me too.